again, I'm John Kay. I'm the director of traditional arts, Indiana. We're a statewide folk arts program that's based at Indiana University. Most states have programs like ours, but usually they're based in state arts agencies. Um, I've directed this program for going on 20 years now. Uh, and, but since 19 or since 2019, we've been doing this apprenticeship program, which basically exists to, to make sure traditional knowledge passes to the next generation. Uh, we're a partnership between Indiana University and the Indiana Arts Commission, which is a branch of state government. And so our money comes from uh, comes from them. We're recognized as the official statewide service organization for Indiana's folk and traditional arts. So we we are out there doing uh, doing this work because we received this charge from the state officially. Uh, we receive uh, support and funding uh, both from Indiana University as well as from the Indiana Arts Commission and and the National Endowment for the Arts. Uh, our federal state level, as well as our university levels, we're receiving funds to do the work uh, that we do here. And our primary charge is that we exist to identify, document, and promote the folk and traditional arts uh, of Indiana, the, the folk traditions of the state. So that's our primary uh, work that we are charged with doing here for the state. We have key programs that we do, and I'll just briefly outline these. We have our field work that we do. We're doing research constantly around the state of Indiana. It's how uh, Quan, we came to know Quan through field work. We identified the Chinese American community in Indianapolis as somebody that we wanted to work with. Uh, we've done work with Paul Tyler documenting uh, Indiana traditions. Uh, we've done work uh, with the Chin community through a folk life survey that we've done. Uh, and so uh, we do field work, which is basically for us to conduct research on the folk arts of the state so that we can better provide services to those communities. We have a traveling exhibit program, which tours uh, free of charge, uh, single panel exhibits to libraries around the state of Indiana. We have the apprenticeship program, which it sounds like most of you are here to find out about the, the apprenticeship program. Uh, and we have our fellowships, which are basically a one-time lifetime achievement award for a folk and traditional artist who's made a significant contribution to their community or to their craft. Uh, and so it's really a, a wonderful program. And we've done that since uh, 2020. And this, uh, uh, I'll tell you about both the apprenticeship programs and the heritage fellowship programs in a little more detail. But first of all, our apprenticeship program. Uh, we've been doing this, as I said, since 2019, and we work with all types of traditional artists who are uh, who are based here in Indiana. Marco Batista is a Zapotec weaver, and he, uh, he's been teaching his nephew uh, the, this traditional craft that goes back generations within his family, both learning the dyeing techniques as well as the weaving techniques. We've done several uh, apprenticeships with uh, people like Amelia Culfer and Kamisha Brown with the Sisters of the Cloth, which is an African-American quilting group up in Fort Wayne, Indiana. We've done work with Larry Haycraft and his grandson, Tyler, who are, make hoop nets for fishing down on the White and the Wabash River. Uh, and they live down in Pike County. Uh, we've done work with uh, members of the Miami tribe up in the northeastern part of our state, uh, such as Katrina Mitten and Josie Cirillo, um, and they do Great Lakes style embroidery. Uh, so you can quickly see that the types of traditions, we do both things that are longstanding in Indiana, like, uh, like hoop net fishing. We serve communities that are longstanding in Indiana, like the Miami, who have been here um, forever. Uh, we also work with more recent immigrants who come here, like Latin American and, and, and Chin and Burmese uh, traditional arts as well. Uh, and so when we say we're serving the traditional arts of Indiana, we don't have some notion that there are certain practices that are uh, specific to Indiana. Actually, we're looking to serve communities that make home in Indiana and the cultural practices that are embedded in those communities communities. Uh, so people like Jim Smoke, who's a bluegrass banjo player, been living in Pekin, Indiana for 50 years, been playing banjos since he was seven years old. Uh, and he we've done apprenticeships with him uh, doing that. Carrie Zimmerman, 
fourth, fifth generation of his family to do glass work uh, down in Corden, Indiana. We've done work with Jason Nickel uh, over in Brown County who does iron work, uh, does ornamental iron uh, that's kind of distinctive to Brown County. Uh, and for him to pass on that uh, that style of iron work within his family. African-American drum making uh, in Indianapolis, uh, ballet folklorico up in East Chicago. There's been Afri or there's been uh, Latin Americans, Mexican Americans specifically in East Chicago since at least the 1890s. Uh, and ballet folklorico and mariachi and other cultural practices have just been part of Indiana fabric for well over a uh, hundred years now. Uh, and so we're looking for things that represent uh, the traditional arts, those cultural practices that are embedded in communities. So when we do our apprenticeship programs, we're looking to serve communities through investing in master artists to make sure that a traditional art form continues uh, to the next generation in that community. Um, so apprenticeships, uh, the way they traditionally work, although there's not one hard fast rule for these, but uh, in general, a master artist finds their own apprentice. So someone who wants to apply for this program. So like Vicki Graber, who's on the, on the, zoom here with us today she's been in the program before she identifies somebody that she wants to teach in her community uh and so they identify that person it's very hard for us to try to go out and find a master artist for somebody who wants to learn uh from someone now if you can identify what are the traditional arts in your community uh and then identify who are the tradition bearers in that that's the way to go with that. And we'll talk more about that in a second. The financials of it, uh, based on what I've been told from the state, we'll probably fund about six of these this year, six or eight of these this year. Uh, and we basically support folks for a year long apprenticeship um, uh, through it. And we pay the master artist a $3,000 stipend or honorarium. Uh, and that's for their instruction that they don't have to spend that on the apprentice or anything like that. The apprentice then receives up to one thousand uh, dollars for materials, for transportation, for whatever, uh, for whatever they need to do that. So they put together a budget. So if you're a, a fiddler uh, and you need a new fiddler, you need a new bow, you've got up to a thousand dollars to do that. If you need to buy a recorder to record your your sessions. Uh, that you are learning, uh, learning at, or a video camera, or whatever. You can make if you can make a case for you need this for your apprenticeship to be successful. You can do that. Applications are due October thirty first, twenty twenty three. I'm hoping that we can stick with that deadline. We've pushed back in some previous years, uh, but I, October thirty first is the last date, so I can let people know by uh, Thanksgiving uh, time whether they've received uh, support or not. Um, let me say just a few more things about the uh, apprenticeship program. Uh, first, uh, what often ends up being the problem, let me just do this. I'm gonna stop sharing so you can see me. What often ends up being the problem is many times the master artist in the apprenticeship program uh, picks the wrong apprentice. Uh, that's uh, usually if the, if something falls apart, it's usually not the person who's doing the the lead teacher in this. It's usually the per, a person who's actually um, they picked someone who's either a not part of their community, and so there's not what's the value uh, in in passing on this knowledge to them, or b uh, somebody who's never done something in that tradition or practice before uh you know why are we going to invest in in someone to learn to do iron work if they've never uh tried blacksmithing before uh no matter how important it might seem that that tradition continues it's just not wise for us to invest in someone who's not bothered to learn a little bit about that so like vicky and nicole were just talking nicole shared that they had um uh, that they had been already working with Vicky to do, uh, to do some basketry, uh, then that means that there's 
uh, there's already a, a, a level of work that's happening there that uh, that could be built upon. Um, so starting with a novice is usually not the place to start for these. We fund so very few of these that we really try to make sure that we're funding um, funding at a, a at a top level. Um, so those are probably the two biggest things. One, you pick somebody not from your community. Two, you pick someone the, who is not um, who is not part of um, who's not prepared yet to do the apprenticeship. Uh, the third problem is it's not a traditional art and that sometimes we have a very broad definition of what a traditional art is uh, i have a very inclusive view it becomes very easy to see if we're talking about burmese weaving chin weaving uh, that's been passed down for 15 or 16 generations it's easy to see that that's a, a tradition that's embedded uh, within a community but it doesn't have to be always that ancient art form like that uh when i asked mike earlier oh how did you know well i did an apprenticeship with bill dylan in brown county there's there's a there's a cultural practice of doing that work that's the same thing that happened with jason nickel there was an older blacksmith that he learned from and that set up a whole trajectory of the of a cultural practice in a place uh so if we just say, oh, I'm going to make art, it becomes much harder. But if you, when you talk to a traditional artist, a master artist, they almost always will say, oh, I learned from this person. This person was really important to me in my practice of doing this. And that that's often how, uh, how traditional arts happen. Um, so let me, let me pause right there because I think several of you are interested uh, in the apprenticeship program. And let's see if there are any questions that you want to ask about the program. Uh, all of the application forms have been updated online and you can get to those from our website, uh, traditional arts, Indiana or traditional arts .indiana .edu. Uh, And you can get both a word document that you can type into and a PDF. But if you've got a question, just unmute and ask it. Anybody? Often people have questions around work samples. Uh, we wanna see work samples that, uh, that show the type of work that you do, the quality of work. So getting some, um, getting some good photographs uh, of your work is important. Uh, photos of the apprentice's work is also uh, sometimes very helpful. Uh, if there's information that you can provide that talks about the traditionality of the art form, uh, newspaper articles or something like that that you want to submit, you can do that as well. Letters of support, getting good letters of support from uh, people who are in the community or in the craft or within the music tradition or dance tradition. All of those things are helpful for us uh, in doing that. Quan, did you have a question for us? Uh, yeah, John, uh, I really appreciate that, you know, your verbal description makes it a lot easier for me to understand, you know, uh, the, 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 what are the, the essential elements of your uh, apprentice uh, program. Uh, there is a one question comes to my mind, perhaps that question is more applicable to the Chinese community, but not that much to, maybe not that much to other community. Now, I just brought up three potential uh, program. They're not potential, but they're ongoing programs in Chinese community. Potential means the potential for us to submit application. Number one is the Lion Dance program, which is a very active program. The orchestra program, which has been around for several years. The, so as well, the calligraphy and, uh, and the China's painting program. But all these three programs, uh, we are not focusing on one or two or small number of students or members, though, you know? 
For example, the line dense program probably that has a less member. We, we maybe talk about maybe two or three members. Perhaps you know that fits more into what you describe as student. Now, right. for the orchestra, we have a whole group. You, you, you witnessed that. We right. have, uh, uh, well, perhaps 20 people. Right. They're all learners, you know. And so as well, the calligraphy and the painting class that we are associated mm -hmm. with. But, so how do you but, advise us on this? Uh, yeah, let me yeah. give you three three ways to think, uh -huh. to think through this. Sure. Uh, one is... Um, is there a way to uh, in which something uh, something is a subset? So, like Chinese calligraphy, there's the stuff that you do for the whole group, but there's probably right, right. Uh -huh. you know there's a difference between what you teach everybody to do and what you, a master would teach a ah, excellent student. I see. And so, what okay. we're looking for is not necessarily someone to teach the masses because we know that that already happens. Mm -hmm. We're not looking to supplant or to replace somebody's lessons that they're already mm -hmm. paying for i see um, okay but uh if there's a, a cultural practice let's say the erhu player this boat instrument player in the orchestra wants to take on two apprentices to teach them the repertoire of that they could they could take on one or two apprentices and that works mm -hmm. so on things like the the chinese lion dance and stuff when we did the ballet folklorico, one of the things that we were, they were already teaching lots of students how to do this, this, this yeah. Mexican folk dancing. Uh, but what we, what made their application successful was the fact that they were trying to teach the next generation of teachers. So the idea of like, oh, you're not teaching just everybody how to do lion dance, but actually you're helping prepare the next person who someday in the future might do their own lion dance someplace, uh, maybe in Indianapolis or, or in another community uh, in the greater Indianapolis area. So it's the idea of like, how are you seeding the future, not just teaching a bunch of people uh, the basics? Is that helpful? You're muted. You're, you're muted. Okay. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense uh, that uh, I have a better understanding that we are not really trying to, I mean, the programs are not really trying to replace an existing program, existing class. Yeah. So, so, so what a good. Yeah. So, so okay, yeah, so okay. if there's somebody who's like already of a higher level that you mm -hmm. want to take up to a master's level that, that needs that extra time, Right, Those right, would be the right. people I'd look to, or someone who you say, mm -hmm. oh, we want them to be a teacher in our community someday in the yeah. future. Okay. We need to prepare them for that. Okay. Okay. I got it. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. No problem. Any other questions? Anybody there? Vicky would ask one, but she can't unmute her phone. So <laughs> that's okay. If if there's uh if there's nothing else, I'm happy to answer more questions. But I also wanted to make sure I talked a little bit about our heritage fellowship program, because uh, that's also something that I think some of you should be uh, aware of. And Quan, this might be something you definitely know people who should be nominated uh, for this. Let me share my screen again. Um, Okay, um, so the Heritage Fellowship Program, that's the second biggest program that we do. Uh, the The apprenticeship program is very much about uh, making sure that the traditional knowledge passes to the next generation. But then there's also this program we call our Heritage Fellowship Program. It's, it's uh, basically designed to be a lifetime achievement award uh, for folk and traditional arts. So here's some of the basic gist of it. Uh, master artists are, are nominated by someone in their community. They can nominate themselves, but usually this this is a grant to a community. It's to an individual, but it's recognizing who a community is by recognizing a master artist from that community. Uh, and so it's looking at the, at the traditional 
um, the traditional arts of a place. Uh, it's reviewed then by an external panel, the same thing that happens for our apprenticeship program. Uh, I don't pick people just because I like them. Uh, we have external reviewers that come in and they select people. Uh, our staff helps people with the preparation and, and the, the crafting of successful nominations. We're, we're here to help in all of that. And the recipients receive uh, both a $1,000 stipend and a handmade piece of art. And we've had all different types of uh, art forms. Um, while we have a fairly expansive definition of the of uh, folk arts uh, for the apprenticeship program, uh, we're a little more conservative with how we define it for the Heritage Fellowship Program, in part because our hope is that we are able to bring people, uh, nominate people for a national endowment uh, for the Arts Heritage Fellowship. And so we use the, the NEA's definition of what the folk and traditional arts are, and that's this. A folk and traditional arts, which includes craft, dance, music, oral traditions, visual arts, and others, are those that are learned as part of a cultural life of a community whose members share a common ethnic heritage, cultural mores, language, religion, occupation, or geographic region. These traditions are shaped by the aesthetics and values of a shared culture and are passed from generation to generation, most often within family and community through observation, conservation, and practice. And so that's a little bit of a mouthful, but it kind of gives you a sense that we're looking at these, um, at these people who are recognized leaders. We get lots of applications for these and they're fairly competitive. We usually only do a couple of them a year. Um, uh, back during the pandemic, we did a few more, but we're probably back down to only doing a couple uh, of these programs a year. Uh, we ask for letters of support from the communities, from, from community law uh, leaders. Uh, we get letters from uh, fellow artists or other community members, uh, people who have learned from them, from their apprentices. Uh, arts professional or cultural profess professionals uh, within a community. Sometimes there are folklorists who have worked with people that write letters, any legislators or civic leaders. Uh, anyone can, but you need to make sure that whoever you pick, that it's actually somebody who, um, who can explain why their support matters, that has something important to say. It's not just a friend who says, yeah, they're a good guy. That It would be great for them to, to get this award uh, or, or, or that sort of thing. So you want to make sure that you're picking people to do that. Uh, much like uh, the apprenticeship program, work samples are really important for this. Uh, if it's a visual art, we want photographs of artwork if, from the artist or maybe of the performer uh, performing. Uh, video, especially for musical performance or audio recordings. Are important video clips or uh, any print publications newspaper publications are all uh, really helpful for us to show that there's longevity within that person making a contribution within that particular community and so those are some of the things that the work sample to do uh, as i said the we give a thousand dollars to the person and then we have an art prize uh, this is um Tom Winsek. Tom is uh, makes our our awards for us, and he custom makes these beautiful redware plates, and he's given those out uh, the past several years. We've also done other art prizes. We do celebrations both in communities, and then every few years we bring people to campus here at Indiana University, and we recognize the Heritage Fellows as well as the apprenticeship teams uh, when we do uh, when we do that. Sandra Brothers, another. Uh, African-American quilter from Fort Wayne, Jim Smoke, who I mentioned before, Carrie Zimmerman, I mentioned before. Uh, you see uh, uh, Dick Lehman from up in uh, up in Goshen, Indiana, uh, received it this year. This year, we also uh, gave it out to Stephen and Nancy Dickey, old time fiddlers from down in, in uh, Orange County, Indiana. Uh, and Helen Kiesel, a German-American accordion player from down in Hobstad, uh, Indiana. Uh, and so these programs basically exist to honor these lifetime achievement of, of people. And so these are often when you say, mention a person, uh, a place and a cultural practice that there's like, oh yeah, that person instantly comes to mind. 
Or if you think of a community group, um, I bet Quan, if I said, well, who's the most significant artisan within your community as far as being a cultural leader? You could probably come up with someone. If I asked MM, who are, who's the most significant weaver uh, practicing in your community? Uh, she'd be able to give me a name uh, of somebody. Those are the types of people that we're looking for for this award. It needs to be someone who everyone just goes, oh yeah, that's obvious. It has to be, uh, has to be that person. So two very different programs. One is to make sure that we give new people uh, a start or newer people a start in this traditional art. Uh, the other is to recognize the lifetime achievement and accomplishments of a, of a folk artist. Um, and, uh, and, and that's the program. So if you know people who, uh, who you, uh, want to nominate or we should reach out to i'm happy to do the leg work uh to make that happen uh i'm gonna stop sharing my screen and see what other questions you all might have for either the heritage fellowship or the apprenticeship program James, you got any questions? You didn't get to introduce yourselves uh, earlier to the group. Uh, do you want to introduce yourself and tell us why you're here, what you're interested in? Maybe you can't unmute there. Um, you don't have to. Uh, but if you can, you're welcome to. Uh, I had a question. Ask away, Allie. Um, sorry, I have so have a small one that needs me, but um, it's okay. I was wondering what people usually do as far as how many times they meet with their master, like how many times the master and the apprentice meet or, you know, kind of roughly that, what's typical. That, and then I was also wondering if you could talk about the way that they hear their the way what? afterwards. Say that last part again, the way. The way they share their learning at the end of the year, what they've yes. learned. Okay. Um. Okay, first of all, uh, it is up to the apprenticeship team to find out what, tell us what is appropriate for meeting. For many people, that is um, once a week, once every other week. Uh, it depends upon the, the traditional art. Uh, there are some people uh, for whom the traditional art is like, oh, yeah, we may meet a few times, but actually we're going to spend uh, three weeks in the summer working on this is the primary time that we're going to do it. And we're going to spend all day for a smaller amount of time. You know, some traditions require big chunks of time real close together. Some are all about, oh, you do a little bit all year long and you practice in between each one of those uh, to get build it up. So we don't have a designated how much time it takes. Uh, this is a significant funding uh, opportunity for for our program and so we we want to make see enough investment that it's it's serious for uh serious commitment for both the master artist and the apprentice uh in doing this but it's up to you all to decide what's the appropriate amount amount uh as far as sharing and one of the things we ask for in the application we have two ways that we ask for the recipients of this program to um to do this, we will invite you probably to campus at some point for some type of program. We will pay you separate um, from the funding that you receive for this program to do that, but we'll bring you to campus for probably an award ceremony at some point, and we'll have you do demonstrations. Uh, we may do an exhibition of some of your work or something like that on campus here. The other, uh, the other thing that we ask of people is, that you come up with a strategy, a plan for presenting it to your community. So when we work with members of the uh, Indiana Blacksmith Association, they they worked into their plan at the annual meeting of the Indiana Blacksmith Association. They were going to come and they were going to demonstrate and they were going to um, they were going to recognize them at that uh, for the apprenticeship program. Uh, I, sometimes it's uh, at a at a festival or at a a certain holiday or even a religious service sometimes that there's some special thing that's part of the the annual cycle of things for that community that that, that, that we hope that you um, 
are presented at or participate in. So I hope that helps with that. Uh, that's also for you all to define. That's within your local, your local or whatever your network community is. Okay. Uh, let me open up my chat here because I'm not seeing it here. Uh, Catherine says, so traditional arts is a funder. How are recipients getting the word out about uh, come and learn this traditional art form? Is there a list of artists or Indiana locations you promote so people can connect? Uh, often, because we're doing this as community, often these things actually just happen within uh, within community groups. Uh, I know James is part of woodworking group. If I started talking about woodworkers, over in uh you know i've mentioned bob taylor the wood carver over there everybody would know who bob taylor is over there he, he's kind of the recognized person so the the thing is if you're in that community group or i ask Quan uh about who who plays air who well if you know the chinese orchestra you probably know the people who do that music you're going to know who it is so it's it's about starting with that community group. So we don't have, we have artists that we work with, but we don't have like a published list of like, these are designated traditional artists. We're always hoping to add new people to our roster all the time that we're serving. Uh, in fact, we asked people, we have had multiple people who have served more than once in our apprenticeship program, uh, but we asked that they take at least one year off between application cycles. Hopefully that's helpful. Are there any other uh, through the year-long apprenticeship? How many lessons? Okay, sorry, I skipped that one. Uh, any other questions? You can type into the chat or feel free to ask. Well, I have a question, John. Yes, sir. Uh, now, uh, <laughs> do the applicants necessarily need to belong to a 501c3 nope. nonprofit? Okay. We we uh, anyway, in fact we do not fund five hundred one c threes. We fund individual artists. I see. I see. Okay. Yeah, that's very important. So so if we did it, it it would probably be whoever the director of the of the lion dance group. Right. We'd probably right, be right. funding him to teach somebody. I see. Okay. Yeah. This is very. We probably important. could fund a five hundred one c three, but that's not the normal way that we do it. I see. Okay. Okay. Very important for me to know. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Any other questions? I'm really excited about this year. I think we're going, I've talked with lots of other people um, about the program. And I think we, we will have a really nice, robust list of applicants uh, this year. I'm hopeful uh, for that. Uh, one of the things I find to be really great about the apprenticeship program is the cohort effect. We, uh, we meet quarterly as a group uh via zoom uh and we uh people share their their progress and, and that sort of thing and that's been very we didn't start out doing that but we've done that past three years i think uh and it's been really positive because it kind of keeps people moving forward when they know they're going to have to share what it is that they've been done with their time uh over uh over the, the certain period and the mutual respect that people have for or people who are uh, are really master artists within their with whatever their genre is, whether it's old time banjo or whether it's Zapotec weaving, uh, is just really uh, really great to see that mutual respect that happens uh, uh, through this group. Uh, once someone is selected, a team is selected for both the Heritage Fellowship or the apprenticeship. Um, We'll do field work with you. We'll we'll do an interview. We'll send a photographer. We'll photograph people. Uh, we write things up. We do nice print publications about the apprenticeship teams every year uh, at the end of, of the year. And that's been really um, good to kind of create a nice record of, of the folks who have been a part of this work. Um, and so if you want, you can go to our website and you can download some of those PDFs of those previous publications and see the types of work where we we've crafted nice stories about each of the apprenticeship teams. So, 
that's all I've got for you all. I'm happy to hang out here a little bit longer and answer any questions, uh, but I'll put it on you all. Uh, again, my name is John Kay. We're here to help you uh, in this. And Vicki has unmuted herself, it looks like. I figured it out. I wanted to let you know that I'm not totally stupid with technology. So. <laughs> <laughs> Operative word is totally. <laughs> <laughs> totally marginally. <laughs> That's great. It's good to hear in your voice, my friend. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions or anything? Hey, John, I didn't make very many comments during this because I was just, it came on as out of interest, but I might shoot you an email on the side, just some thoughts. But, you know, I think what I struggle with is, I mean, and thanks for recognizing we met out at the woodworking in Brown yeah. County. I, I think a lot of people struggle with the concept of master and apprentice when they don't really know. I mean, like they may be a hobbyist, right? Or they may consider themselves a hobbyist. So, right. you know, I'm trying to, I'm trying to just process like, let, you know, what, what, let what, me, what, let me help you with that. Um, yeah. I would view we're not necessarily always working with the master, like the nationally recognized person of a thing. When we say master, we're, we're thinking about it much like the old apprenticeship ways where someone is, is a very skilled practitioner in something yep. who's teaching that next person. They don't have to be like Rembrandt master. Yeah. We're, we're looking at it like the old trades were that this is someone who has a practice skill that they know how to do. And they're going to take on an apprentice and teach them what they need to know to approach that level of mastery themselves. So, yeah, so there's a trades. So there's than... a center. There's a synergy here that I think could be made, but I'm just not sure how you make the connections. You know, the, um, you know, and I'll stay in woodworking because that's what that's what I'm interested in. But you know, there's woodworkers that tend to maybe not even become experts or even become even good at what they're doing until they're much older in life because they finally have time to do it right because they, they pick it up as a hobby right and they would love to be connected with younger generation to teach them like how to do boxes or how to make a chair or how to make a bookcase or something but they don't really know how to do that because now their kids are already grown up and you know maybe their grandkids aren't interested and then i look at someplace like iu which has an which has a burgeoning you know woodworking club but they don't know where to go Right. They don't know who to connect. They don't know who, 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 who could teach them. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and they want to have a shop that they can call their own and the university is going to be like, eh, you know, safety and we don't want to be responsible for it. You know, so there's, I think there's an opportunity here. I just, I just, I, I came mainly out of interest and I just, I, I think I just want to let these ideas keep bouncing around in our heads and try to figure out if there's a way to connect people to, to like if somebody had an interest in box making or something simple, you know, yeah, let's focus on boxes or let's focus on chairs or let's focus on something. Yeah, and there's definitely been, uh, you know, if the if I had a way of replicating myself uh, to where I could do everything, uh, I would love nothing more than to have a, a school of folk craft or something like that here at IU, uh, at yeah. where, where we would have yeah. master artists that would come in and teach like week long chair making classes, or have Vicky come and do willow basketry uh, classes mm -hmm. here for students and stuff, and yep. um, but. It would take me having to do a whole lot of fundraising and a whole lot of other work. And I just don't know that that's going to necessarily. And it's, and it's probably more practical to just be done at like a meet and greet session where you say, these are the things I'm capable of teaching anybody who might be interested. And I'd be happy to host you one weekend a month over at my garage or apartment, you know, or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, trying to figure out how to make that work, you know, right. Right. Yeah, I, th I think those kind of vernacular systems, I think quilt makers, I think woodworkers do a pretty decent job of it. Uh, I don't know that the intergenerational, they do the intergenerational thing as well as the quilt yeah. makers do. Uh, well, and, and, and there's a lower barrier of entry for certain things that don't require, you know, as much machinery and safety protocols and things. But, you know, and then there's a lot of baggage around you know, when you say woodworking, that can mean a lot of different things. And, you know, right. the same can be true of fiber arts, you know, or, you know, right. I mean, I mean, somebody might be like, I want to focus on quilts and somebody else might say, I, I do, I, I do a different kind of thing. So. Yeah. The thing I would think about if you were thinking about through this program, uh, doing, a doing something, I would, 
we've had people who have who have said, "Oh, I want to teach traditional woodworking skills to an apprentice. Um, uh, how to use planes and chisels, and you know how to do just basic uh, woodworking." Or we're going to learn to do build this type of furniture or something. I think you have to make the case of why this art form is important to this community. And so if you think about in Brown County, if there, if there's some type of very, dis, or go back to the Bob Taylor thing. Bob Taylor does a very distinctive landscape relief carving style uh, that is uh, very traditional uh, and emerged from a lifetime of work um, that he can tell you the whole story about. It's much easier to see that as a traditional art than uh, than the Bob Vila. Um, uh, I'm gonna build, fill my basement with equipment and make cabinets. Uh, it's just two different two different approaches to this. One, you can say, oh, this is very place based or very community based. Or if you're going to do Weberding's uh, woodworking altar work uh, over in uh, in um, uh, Franklin County, I don't know if you know them or not, but they do German church altars and that sort of thing it's easier to see the community and the tradition i can um, i can picture it i can picture it i'm not familiar but i can picture it absolutely multi-generational family weberdings you'd love going over to their shop sometime they're just really really sweet great people um anyway what other questions do people have i can always rattle on and on on these topics but we're quickly coming up on an hour Mike, did you have anything you wanted to ask? Was any of this make any sense or seem? Uh, yeah, I think some some of the things that were asked or talked about were questions I had. I, you know, with a with an apprenticeship in in our in our like leather world, like the we we have some apprentices that have come in from France before to work mm -hmm. with us, and we have one now, and their their apprenticeship is uh, is you know four to four to eight years really overall out of their guild right. it's a thousand year old guild in paris and uh it's been really interesting having them here over the years we got one right now but with with the the young lady that's uh you know talking with me about this right now you know over one year and and uh you know she's in school and i mean it's it's going to be we're, we're really going to be focused on just like one kind of part of learning you know of, of yep. this you know, crap so um, I mean, that's, you know, we're going to be fairly focused maybe with what we do with, with the time allowed in a year to, to work on something with her not being like really immersed in it. Uh, um, so that's, I mean, that's acceptable. Is that right? If we're, she'll be doing, learning to do something, but it wouldn't be like the entire, that's. Yeah. Acceptable. Yeah. Yeah. We fully know that you're not going to become a master leather worker in one year. Uh, it takes a, a it could be a lifetime uh, pursuit and and we've had we've had fairly young people uh, be involved with this and sometimes it's like giving them that seeding them the desire to learn more later uh, is also part of it I think the thing for you to do is to think about what makes the leather work that you want to teach is there some through line of that that connects it to your your own tradition of becoming an apprentice and learning leather work and how you're going to pass that on to this next person that there's actually a, a trajectory and a through line there of like, yeah, this is, this is how leather work is done in Brown County. And this is how I'm teaching uh, here. So think about that. And that might be helpful okay. for a successful application. Yeah. And I'm happy to talk with you more, more about that. I'm sure once I see the application, I'll have a lot more questions. I'm sure that's going to open up a whole bunch of what right. ifs or what what can yeah. be done. So. All of it, it, all of it is online now, so you can go to our website and you can download the application as PDF or a, or a doc file, either one. Okay. And, oh, here's a question I've got, John. Well, this is a 15 year old. So what kind of, uh, and, and she has worked with me a little bit already before. But what kind of like permission do I need from parents or anything like that? Is that all in the application since this is not an adult that's going to be working with me? Anytime someone is working with a minor, especially if it's not a, a parent, uh, I what I do is I have a conversation with both the uh, master artist who's, who's in it and the parent. And I basically say, 
I'm not going to tell you how how to do this, but it's your all's responsibility to keep them safe. And that we all, I just have a very frank conversation that we all get on the same page about, you know, is this the type of thing where you leave somebody, can you leave this person alone with this person? Is How, how is this going to happen? What's going to keep you safe, Mike? What's going to keep the minor safe? Uh, we just have a very frank conversation about that. I found that I think it would be a legal nightmare for me to try to, to, to figure out all the ins and outs of what could go wrong. But I think if I put it back on you all just to come up with the best plan and very open communication about it, I find that to be the, the smartest way through. That's what I've done in the past. All right. So I have you. no expectations of that, but I expect you as the frontline people to be fully invested in making that happen. All right. Thanks, John. Okay. Any other questions? If not, thank you all for coming and thank you so much for your interest in this program. Uh, I'm here to help uh, and I'm excited that, uh, uh, that there's uh, interest in this. As I said, I think this will be a, a fairly competitive year for both the Heritage Fellowships and for the apprenticeship program. Uh, but I think that there'll be, uh, it, it will be a, a, a good cohort of people uh, that'll be a part of it. Uh, October 31st is the deadline, and then the um, we hope to let people know by Thanksgiving weekend is uh, is the plan, whether you're you're in the program or not. Okay, well, thank you so much, John, for your very detailed explanation. Uh, definitely, uh, our community will be very interested uh, in uh, submitting application. Uh, we also understand it is very competitive, but I try. <laughs> yeah. I got um, faith in you all. I'll, I'll okay. For you here. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much again. And well, also, you, uh, please extend uh, uh, our, uh, our my and our uh, uh, to uh, Joey and yes. students that show up in the, at the China a couple of weeks ago. But thank you so much and good night, everybody. Good night. Uh, it sounds like a great back. way for us to close it out. So good Thanks seeing so you all. Nice meeting you, Nicole. Good to uh, meet you, too. Thank you. Bye. Yep, thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.